All right. So now we are getting close to the very end. And uh, we're coming to the very last sutta on this retreat. It's amazing how it is the last sutta and we're coming down to the last 15 minutes. I don't know how this is possible. It seems to always work out. It's like magic. You read the suttas and then the end of the retreat comes and the end of the sutta comes exactly at the end of the retreat. Not always, but usually it is like that. I don't know if there's some higher power in the universe that does this. That seems to be the way it works. So before time runs out, let's have a look at this very last sutta. Majjhima Manikaya, middle length saying 64, long discourse to Malunkya Putta or Malunkya. And uh, this is only a very short extract from quite a long sutta. And the idea now is that we have just looked at all the meditation that leads all the way up to the jhana states, how to attain samadhi. And this very last part here, it shows us how, how insight is practiced. We have looked a little bit at insight already. We looked at the end of the Anapanasati Sutta, how you use the ideas of impermanence, of fading away, of cessation, and then letting go. Yeah, we had a look at that. And this sutta, kind of the last sutta here, it sort of um, expands a little bit on a little bit on that idea, yeah, on how this actually works. And it's quite an interesting sutta in a number of ways. So let's have a look at this as the very last thing that we do on this retreat before we do the last Q&A session. So this is what the Buddha has to say. There is a path and a practice for the giving up of the five lower fetters. These are the things that bind us to samsara, that stops us from being an anagami, a non-returner. It is not possible to know or see or give up the five lower fetters without relying on that path and that practice. Yes, that's kind of interesting. What can that be? What is that path that you have to rely on? Suppose there was a large tree standing with heartwood. It is not possible to cut out the heartwood without having cut through the bark and the softwood. In the same way, there is a path and practice for giving up the five lower fetters. It is not possible to know or see or give up the five lower fetters without relying on that path and that practice. Yeah, so this is very clear that you have to do this practice in order to become a non-returner, an anagami. So what do you think that path is? Now, what is very interesting is that path is basically the jhanas. Yeah? So the Buddha is saying that it isn't possible to become a non-returner or an anagami without, without uh, practicing the jhana. These are an essential aspect of that path. So you have to practice those jhanas. That is, that is quite interesting. And then, of course, when you come out of the jhanas, what do you do then? This is what that part, this sutta is about. So let's see what the Buddha has to say. And what, Ananda, is the path, the practice for giving up the five lower fetters? It is when a mendicant due to seclusion from attachments, the giving up of unskillful qualities, and the complete settling of physical discomfort, quite secluded from sensual pleasures, secluded from unwholesome qualities, enters and remains in the first absorption, which has the rapture of bliss, rapture and bliss born of seclusion, of placing the mind and keeping it connected. That is the description of the first jhana, the standard one. This is a little bit different one here, but essentially it is the description of the suttas of the first jhana. So you enter the first jhana, you enter this deep state of samadhi, then what do you do? And this is where the insight comes. Yeah? And one of the reasons why the jhanas, there's many reasons why the jhanas are so powerful, but one of the reasons why they are so powerful is because you have already abandoned so much. Yeah? It says the standard way that um, 
the jhanas are explained, it says you have given up the five senses. Vivicheva kamehi. And because you have given up the five senses and the body, and you have essentially given up the will, you have given up the five hindrances, there is very little left to be given up. All that is really left to be given up is that experience that you have inside that jhana. And what is that experience? Well, basically, it's such bliss. It's a particular kind of bliss, the bliss of seclusion. That is all that remains in your consciousness. That is all that remains in your whole world. So it's a very small thing to give up at the very end. Almost everything else has, has been given up. There's a very simple remnant of the world that remains. And now you have to give that up. How do you do that? So this is why it is relatively easy, because you have already simplified things so much by giving up so much. Also because you have given up the hindrances that distort your mental outlook, and also because you have developed a mind that is powerful, that can penetrate, that is stable, that can stay with the object. All of these things help to enable insight to happen. So this is how you do it. They contemplate, they contemplate the phenomena there, that which, is, that which is included in form, in feeling, in perception, in choices and consciousness. <clears throat> you contemplate it as impermanent, as suffering, as a disease, as a boil, as a dart, as misery, as an affliction, as alien, as falling apart, as empty, as non-self. They turn their mind away from those things and apply it to the deathless element. This is peaceful, this is sublime. That is the stilling of all activities, the letting go of all attachments, the ending of craving, cessation and extinguishment. Abiding in that, they attain the ending of the defilements. If they don't attain the ending of defilements, with the ending of the five lower fetters, they are reborn spontaneously because of their passion and love for that meditation. They are extinguished there and are not liable to return from that world. This is the path and practice for the giving up of the five lower fetters. So here we are coming to the very end of the path. And I always think it is nice to take the path of meditation all, to the, all the way to the very end to understand what is happening at this particular point. So what you do here is that you look at those phenomena inside the first jhana state. Yeah? And those phenomena inside the first jhana state, well, there will be an aspect of form, feeling, perception, choices, and consciousness. Whatever is left of those things, that is what you look at at that particular time. And of course, the form aspect of the first jhana is a very refined aspect of your perception. You're perceiving something which is still related, a remnant from the five senses. There is the feeling there, a very blissful kind of feeling that you have when you come to this particular state. Yeah, that is the feelings there, very positive. The perception is basically also just the bliss. The choices at this point is just the very small movement of the mind in the first jhana, and the consciousness is the awareness. Yeah? So however the five aggregates appear within the first jhana, that is what you are contemplating. How do you contemplate it? As impermanent. Yeah? You know you cannot sustain this. You know it is going to change. It will not last forever. And because you know it is impermanent, because you know it is falling apart, you know it is suffering to try to hold on to it. You cannot hold on to it because it will always be changed. It always ends in tears because you have to come out of these things. Yeah, you want them to last forever. This is the greatest happiness you have ever experienced in your life. And now you have to give it up. That's really hard to, to deal with. So in a sense, that state too is suffering because of that. It is a disease, a boil, a dart, a misery, and an affliction. Even though it is the greatest happiness you have ever had, you have to see it as an affliction because it is impermanent. You cannot control it because you cannot control it. Ultimately, it is non-self. You're not going to go to the jhana realm forever after, after you die. 
after you die instead, you are going to go wherever your karma takes you, maybe to the jhana realm for a while, and then reborn somewhere else. You cannot control it. It is not self. Ultimately, it is empty. It is alien even, as it says here. And when you understand that, when you understand that even the most powerful blisses in the universe that can be experienced by a human being, even that ultimately is out of control. Ultimately, you cannot control it. The mind turns away from those things and they apply themselves to uh, the deathless element, the liberation from all death, the freedom from death, the realization that extinguishment is the highest happiness. This is peaceful. This is sublime. The stilling of all sankharas, no more activity in the mind, the giving up of all attachments, the ending of everything, the cessation and craving and the final extinguishment. And abiding in that, that is where either you become an anagami or you become a full arahant as a consequence. That is where these fetters come to an end. So this is kind of the powerful insights at the very, very end of the path. And it's all based, as you can see here, all based on seeing the five aggregates as afflicted by the three characteristics. That whole sequence starting with impermanent and being non-self is just an expansion on the ordinary three characteristics, impermanence, suffering, and non-self. And uh, the jhanas is just one particular way that the khandas manifest. So you apply those three characteristics to the five khandas. And when you see that, when you see that they are affected by these three characteristics, that is when you make that great breakthrough. And eventually you become fully enlightened as a consequence. So this is the path all the way to the end, how it works. So let's finish the sutta off. Ah, only one more paragraph. Okay, that's, that's really good timing because uh, it's coming to an end. So furthermore, as the placing of the mind and keeping it connected are still there, a monastic, a layperson, an upasika, an upasaka enters and remains in the second absorption, the third absorption, the fourth absorption, the fourth jhana. They contemplate the phenomena there as impermanent, as suffering, as diseased, as a boil, as a dart, as a misery, as an affliction, as alien, as falling apart, as empty, as non-self. They turn their mind away from those things and apply it to the deathless element. This is peaceful, this is sublime. That is the stilling of all activities, the letting go of all attachments, the ending of craving, cessation and extinguishment. Abiding in that, they attain the ending of defilements. And if they don't attain the ending of defilements, with the ending of the five lower fetters, they are reborn spontaneously because of the passion and love for that meditation. They are extinguished there and are not liable to return from that world. This is the path and practice for the giving up of the five lower fetters. So there you are. This is how you become an anagami or an arahant. Yeah, it's very simple. <laughs> It's not very hard. One of the things that I always remember is when you meet some of these amazing people in the world, and many of them happen to be monks, because when you are a monk yourself, you meet many amazing monks. And then when you meet them, they, you say, oh, it is so difficult. Yeah, meditation, whoa, so hard to meditate. And they say meditation is the easiest things in the world. And then you say, oh, it's so hard to attain the jhanas. The Satan in the jhanas is the easiest thing in the world. And you say it's so difficult to become a stream or an arahant. You say it's the easiest thing in the world. And the reason why it is hard is because all of these things are blocking us in a certain way. There are all these blockages on the path. But actually the seeing of these things, the allowing of the path to unfold, actually the path is very easy. It goes by itself. 
We are standing in the way. We are making the problems on this path. But by letting go, by just turning our mind in the right direction, ultimately by having right view, by looking at the world in the right way, the path just unfolds. None of these things are difficult. It is just that we are making the blockages to all of these things. So this is the path of meditation, according to the Buddha. This is how the Buddha teaches meditation. It really is about preparing the mind in the right way, having the right view, having the right sila, the right ethics, and all of these kind of things. And as you have the right sila and the right ethics and put an enormous amount of effort into ethics, remember kindness. Remember that kindness is incredibly profound. Kindness has to do with our entire being, with our habits, with how we think, with how we perceive the world. It goes to the very core of what we are as human beings. It's a very profound thing. Don't un underestimate the power of kindness. Develop that fully. When you develop that fully, the meditation becomes so much more easy because your mindfulness is already established. And when your mindfulness is established, all you have to do is follow the breath. That fulfills Satipatthana practice. You don't have to make it complicated. You don't have to draw in all of these various ways of meditating. The Buddha's way is mindfulness of breathing. The only thing in the suttas that fulfills Satipatthana is mindfulness of breathing. Nothing else is spoken of in those terms. It's wonderful, isn't it? It makes it so simple. You follow the mindfulness of breathing. You take it all the way through the wonderful blisses, the beautiful pieces of the path, uh, becoming more and more powerful. You're building it up uh, until one day you attain the jhana states. Uh, and when you attain the jhana states, uh, all you have to do is turn your mind, understanding that even they cannot be controlled. Uh, and then one day, hopefully, every one of us uh, will be an anagami and an arahat. Uh, that is the idea. That is the path. Uh, Good luck with the practice. Let's do five more minutes of meditation and I finish off with a bit of Q&A.